from in the West Midlands. Um, got it. Um, I start, I'm the only person on our interfaith forum who really is um, uh, interested in, in social media. So I started a Facebook page exactly a year ago. Um, I still consider ourselves uh, beginners. So obviously I'd like to, to learn more. Grant, thank you. Uh, Mahinda. You need to unmute Mahinda. Uh, Mohinder Singh Chana from Bradford Concord Interfaith Society. Do you want me to say some more? Well, it, well, is there one thing you'd really like to get out of this afternoon? Oh, yes, I, I def definitely I'd like to upskill myself. Um, I, uh, do a bit of uh, social, uh, 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 on the social media, uh, but there's a, one can learn a lot. So I hope to upskill. Uh, whatever little I know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, and I hope, I hope to enjoy your company as well. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> Sarah Cottrell. Yes, hello. I'm a vicar from Worcester and I'm secretary to our Worcestershire Interfaith Forum. Um, I can't say there's one thing I want to learn. I'm an absolute technophobe, so any tips will be helpful to me. <laughs> Thank you. Penny, Penny Siddle. Uh, yes, uh, I'm from the York Interfaith Group and I currently serve as their secretary. Uh, we uh, kind of have made moves into social media in the last 18 months, really, but, you know, with some, uh, some success. But we're looking for uh, kind of further insight, uh, particularly about uh, content, how to be more effective with what we uh, already do. Um, and and some insight into differences in pages and groups as we just have a group page but maybe we should be considering uh, you know we just have a group sorry and maybe we should have a page so just looking for some That's some good. knowledge and understanding there thank you for that Penny. Uh, Steve Crawley UK good afternoon I'm Stephen Innes from Crawley uh, Interfaith Network uh, my colleague Ashwin, uh, who's with us this afternoon, um, runs our Facebook page. I'm trying to maintain um, a WordPress website. What I'd like to do ultimately is to see how we might um, join the two together. Thank you very much. Thank you. John Woodhouse. Hello, yes, I'm, I'm a chair of South London Interfaith Group. Um, we've got three people who are quite interested in IT, but I'm the one who set up the Facebook page. Um, our website's looking rather tired at the moment uh, because we've, I've been loading a lot of uh, videos and I'd really like to get that into a better shape, really, because we're coming up to our 40th anniversary, so we're looking to think getting archives digitized and uh, making them available. Um, Instagram is a mystery. Every time I try to do it, I can't do it. Uh, it and I'd really like to know how, because I think actually uh, Facebook is a little bit passe, especially for young people. That's really lovely. Thank you, John. Uh, Sean. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sean Finlay from With Speech Interfaith. Uh, I, I do have a Facebook account, but I, I approach it with great fear of it overtaking my life. And maybe I'll be able to learn this afternoon how to use it rather than be taken over by it. Thank you. And I see you've got your That's mental... That's right. My, my wife, Hilary, is, is Hilary's just listening in so she can help me remember some things. Thank you. <laughs> That's lovely. David, David Musgrave. Good afternoon, all. Good to be with you. David Musgrave, I'm chair of the Bath Interfaith Group, have been for the last 18 months. Um, we are a very, fairly small um, committee or a fairly small number of committed people with, um, with necessary gifts, which has meant that I'm the person running the Facebook page. 
Um, when I took over, my predecessor, in fact, had set it up and was was running it very efficiently. Um, he was quite a whiz kid with, with, with the technology. Um, I don't have the same technological skills, so I've sort of kept it ticking over. But I'm looking forward to getting some insight this afternoon, really, in, in how I could do more with it, much as everybody else has said. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Griffin. Um, hello, I'm Sarah. Um, I chair the Reading Interfaith Group. Uh, we have a totally rubbish Facebook page, which was 10 years out of date, uh, which was when I stood down from the group. Uh, and I found myself chair again after quite a long holiday. Um, I suppose my biggest problem, I've got lots of really good things going for us with the group, and I've got a wonderful group of um, trustees. Um, the problem is I'm an introvert um, and everything I've put down feels like rubbish. So I'd like to be more confident about um, social media. Thank you, Sarah. Ashwin, you need to unmute. Hi, um, like Steve, I'm from Crawley Interfaith Network. Uh, we are also a small organization. Um, Steve runs our website, I run our Facebook and WhatsApp group. Um, what I want to learn or get upskilled around is how to make them more sexy and appealing. Um, I see some of the WhatsApp groups, they are boring. I see Facebook pages, they are boring too, and I see Lots of websites that are boring, and I, I, Steve, if Steve doesn't mind, I want to say the same thing about our website, that it's it's not kind of appealing or sexy enough for young people to come in and uh, take advantage of information that we put out. That's that's the kind of main thing I wanted to get upskilled. The second one is around how to increase our uptake in all this, uh, it's very, it's remained pretty steady, it's not going up, and I want to be able to sort of spread the word around more uh, so that we get more, more members joining or more public figures coming along to join our, our social media pages. That's grand, thank you for that. Okay, can we move to Richard Leslie? Hello, good afternoon. I represent two uh, groups in Hertfordshire, uh, Hartsmere and the Quorum, and uh, they've both been long established. Um, I was hoping to learn something about Zoom and so that we could organise meetings, but if, that's, if this isn't about this, then I'm not sure whether I'm going to be paying too much attention. Anyway, we'll see how we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. And finally, Yogesh. You need to unmute, Yogesh. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Yogesh Shoshi from um, Watford Interfaith Association. Uh, we have been using uh, Facebook. Uh, there's a Facebook presence uh, for Watford Interfaith Association where we publicize the events we organize and share other things. Um, Watford Interfaith Association is also involved with the Peace Garden in the Cassiobury Park in Watford area. So there's a separate Facebook page actually highlighting the work which is going on in the Peace Garden. And we have a website as well, which is basic, as Sarah mentioned, probably similar to hers, um, but at least we try to keep updated. But since last year, especially since the lockdown, um, we've been obviously having all the meetings on Zoom and um, last year's internet interfaith pilgrimage uh, we had a virtual one instead of um, in-person one which we used to do every year and that was live streamed on youtube as well okay so we keep doubling and i'm here as really basically to share experiences and learn from each other at least to how we can improve things thank you thank you, very much. Thank, you. thank you before i uh, go on and introduce ashley uh, could i just say this has been recorded uh, uh, and we'll use that. We don't, we're not quite sure how we're going to use the recording, whether we'll make the whole recording available or whether 
uh, we're going to make a note from this and then publish that note. Is there anybody who would object if we were to put this out uh, in a digital format? You know, they wouldn't want to appear in it because we have the ability to edit people out, I believe. No. And the other thing is, if we take, is everybody happy if we take screenshots that we may use? Anybody like not to be in a screenshot? I'll take that then as affirmative for everybody. So thank you very much for that. But without more ado, I'll hand over to Ashley. I know Ashley's been listening and making notes on what people have been saying. Um, and uh, over to you, Ashley, if you'd like to introduce yourself and I'll mute myself. Thanks very much, David. Um, so uh, my name is Ashley Beck. I'm the Interface Development Officer at the Interface Network. And I think I've met nearly all of you either in person or, or via Zoom over the last year or two. Um, the opening part of this session, um, I'm, I'm just going to focus on um, general reflections that might pick up on a couple of the questions that were in the program, particularly the first couple. I'm not going to try and address everything um, in the opening reflections because I think it's much better to, to be guided by you and the questions you want to ask as we open up the rest of the session. Um, so uh, I'm not trying to address everything there. Um, and I think I'm, as we go along, I think many of you might be able to offer um, answers to some of each other's questions as well. So um, that, that I think the general approach will take. Um, but sort of beginning with um, the uh, beginning with social media um, and why um, this particular session. So this session we described as focusing on um, Twitter and Facebook in particular. Um, the rationale for that really was that they are both the most commonly used social media platforms in the UK, with a caveat to that, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and they're also the most commonly used by IFN's member local interfaith groups at the moment. So that's based on our, the latter bit is based on our own research. Um, the caveat though, is that um, there are actually a couple of social media platforms that usually rank higher than Twitter. Facebook, often at the top um, of the lists. Um, but things like YouTube are often higher than Twitter now. Instagram can be higher depending on who does the list. Um, and sometimes things like WhatsApp are included. Um, personally, I consider things like WhatsApp and Messenger to be more instant messaging than social networking or social media, but they're, they're very closely interrelated and I'm happy to try and deal with questions on any of those um, later on. Um, as I said, uh, most of our local member groups seem to be using um, Facebook and Twitter the most. However, there are a number of our groups which um, are using Instagram to very good effect. Um, and there are a number that have started using YouTube, particularly since the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, and yeah, as I said, there are different ways that people rank these sites when they're figuring out what the most popular ones are. Uh, Twitter usually comes about third or fourth or fifth. Um, in 2020, a number of the ranking sites actually put YouTube at the top, so higher than Facebook. Um, and that those tended to be the ones that ranked them in terms of the most active users rather than the number of users with accounts. Uh, makes sense at all. So Instagram, though, um, just to say a little bit about it, focuses on visual content. Um, it's particularly designed for sharing images um, or sets of images. I think you can post up to 10 in one post. Um, and it allows you to share short video clips, usually up to about a minute long. Although it is possible to share longer videos if you've got add on services like Instagram TV, um, things like that. Um, Instagram usually does rank higher than Twitter on the list of most used platforms in the UK. But we have particularly identified Facebook and Twitter as as possibly the most relevant, to the most number of groups. And that's kind of why we've we focused on those. That's because Instagram is a primarily visual 
um, form of communication and that may not suit every local group. Um, it, it's going to work well for some, but probably not for others. Worth saying, though, that the two most active age demographics on Instagram, and this is just UK users, um, are 25 to 34. And then the second most active age group is 18 to 24. So the 18 to 34 age range, if they're a particular target for you, then Instagram may well be a better choice um, than some of the other platforms. Uh, YouTube, I mentioned, um, most of you will be aware it focuses entirely on video content. Um, and traditionally, of course, creating videos was either pretty expensive um, or required quite extensive skill. Um, now, however, that's getting easier and easier and most smartphones um, are now capable of both recording and basic editing of videos. But crucially, I think, as we've all found out across the last year or so, um, things like Zoom and Teams, which enable us to meet virtually, um, have video recording functionality built into them. So for example, this meeting, at the end of it, the system will generate a recording. Um, and assuming we didn't want to edit it, it would then be quite simple to just pop that on YouTube so that other people can see it. Um, so it, it has, I think, become easier to create certain kinds of video content. And uh, YouTube itself has a basic editor built in now. So it won't do fancy effects or subtitles or things like that. Um, it will do closed caption subtitles, but not other kinds. Um, but it will let you do things like chopping off the beginning and end of a video or, or basic bits like that. Um, but coming back to Facebook and Twitter, um, Twitter, for those not aware, um, is was primarily a text sharing um, uh, platform when it came into being. Um, it allows you to share text of up to 280 characters in length. It used to be half that, but it's now, now that level. Um, and you can attach with it either a video clip uh, or up to four images. Um, so although it is kind of designed around relatively short bits of text, um, these days it tends to be that, in, uh, that um, posts that come with a video or an image get better engagement. Um, not always, and there are other things you can do to, to boost engagement as well, like including links to websites that bring through images or adding things like um, polls, which enable people to interact with them. Um, a little bit. Um, and Facebook is probably the most, well, certainly the most well known um, mixed media platform. I think it's genuinely mixed media in that it, it, it lends itself quite well to longer written pieces of text. Um, but it also enables you to put video clips and polls and um, images and so on uh, with your post. And again, the, the ones that have those often perform better. Although on Facebook, interestingly, um, it, it tends to be if, you put, if you're posting relatively short bit of text, but with an image, it'll do quite well. If you're doing something that's a long piece of text, more than five paragraphs, that might also do well, even if it has no images with it, which is a slightly um, interesting uh, aspect of Facebook. Um, Having said all that, it can be quite daunting, when, especially if you had no prior experience with social media. It can be quite challenging to think about which platforms you might want to use for the work of a local interfaith group. And there's no um, one size fits all answer to that question. As I said, we've picked two platforms to particularly focus on because they're most likely to fit the most number of groups, but they may not be the right ones for your group. And they're key kind of questions to think about um, when trying to decide on a platform. The first is who are we trying to reach? Um, for example, is it existing members? Is it new people? Uh, is it new people that you want to become members or is it a different type of new people? Um, <clears throat> try to find out a bit about which platforms those people are likely to be using. Um, I mentioned that Instagram 
um, seemed to do particularly, uh, had a particularly large cohort um, of people from 18 to 34. Um, so if that was a group you were trying to target, that might influence your decision. All of the platforms um, publish this information and it's often collated by lots of other websites that use slightly different criteria. So it, it's quite easy to get access to that information for free, um, which makes market research a bit easier. Um, there's another question to ask is what platforms are organizations like ours using? Um, and for that, you could have a look at other local interfaith groups on IFN's website. Um, we list at the moment, uh, if, a, if a group has a, a Facebook or a Twitter page, we definitely try to link to that. Um, we don't, I think, yet include Instagram, but we may be adding that in the near future. Um, <coughs> other things you can look at are other groups in your local area that do similar kinds of work. If there are, um, you know, for example, a, a, a kind of um, a, a group representing different um, nationalities or different um, cultural groups, those can be a good kind of key to um, what things might work well. Um, have a think about what kind of content you're likely to be sharing. Um, will you have a ready source of um, regular good photographs? If so, you might want to be thinking more about an image sharing platform like Instagram. Um, will you be able to create video content um, regularly? If so, that might point you towards something like YouTube. If it's going to be more uh, mixed or it's going to be predominantly text, then Facebook and Twitter might be um, top of top of the list. Another key question will be what's what what are your purposes and aims for social media? Um, do you want to get more people involved in events? Um, are you trying to attract donations or donors? Um, do you just want people to interact with the content you post? So uh, you might like them to see your posts because they'll learn more about different faiths and beliefs, but you're not that interested in, or you're not primarily interested in getting them to attend meetings, for example, that, that could affect your decision. Um, and a final question I think to ask is how often are we likely to have content we can post? Um, what's your capacity? Who's going to run it? Um, those sorts of questions are also very useful to think through. So Facebook, <coughs> Uh, sorry, Twitter uh, works very well for sharing things like information about events, um, encouraging attenders at events to engage in conversation during the event. So you can use hashtags, which are basically words with a hash symbol in front of them. Um, but that then enables people to search for those tags and find related bits of conversation. Um, so they're very good for that. They're also quite good for networking with public officials, local journalists, etc. Um, but regular posting is quite important for success on Twitter. Um, it, it requires kind of little and often um, to, to really build up a, a following. Um, and it doesn't generally lend itself to particularly deep forms of engagement. Um, it, it's quite good for little bits of conversation or peaking interest, but not so great for conversational engagement. Um, Facebook, in our experience, um, seems to be quite well suited to encouraging deeper levels of engagement online. Um, many local groups seem to generate healthy discussion um, on their posts in, in the comments, for example. Um, and we wondered whether this might be because it's a platform that members of local groups often feel the most comfortable with they're, they're, it's the one they're most likely to have um, the uh, a couple of other quick points uh, and then i think we'll move into trying to engage with some of the bits that you're that you've raised as um, priorities um, sometimes priorities change within groups um, and I think it's important that we recognize that, that sometimes um, 
you know sometimes we don't have the capacity we once did or sometimes we simply want to focus elsewhere that's good that's okay um i think it's important if um if we no longer feel that a particular social media platform is right for us that we close it uh, rather than leaving it kind of to um to sit there um it's often better to make a conscious decision i think to close it the exception to that though is if you've got lots of archived stuff that you want people to to be able to see um and it's also it can be a very um useful thing to do to try and integrate your platforms where possible so if you have a website include a prominent link on it to your facebook page or your instagram account um and again if you've got facebook account include a link to one of your other accounts if you've got them um this just helps the casual person who might come across you on one of those things to find out where else they might um might be able to find information about you um but i think that's probably enough as kind of opening reflections and i think uh, i'll hand back to david thank you very much ashley thank you i see we have a question in chat uh and uh please feel free to use the chat if you want to put things there um uh, as a question you mentioned uh hashtags um and uh, i see that ashwin's asked you know to explain more how to manage and use them hashtags yeah yeah so in terms of so essentially what a hashtag is is some words with the symbol with the hash symbol in front of it sometimes also called the square symbol um what they look like on the screen is exactly that but they usually become clickable um now I've got an example of one of one that we use each year is hashtag interfaith week that's um i'll just type into the chat what that looks like um just like that um and if you include that in a post on twitter or instagram in particular um then people can click on it and they'll see loads of other posts that are also about that topic so it's a very good way of quickly signaling that your post is linked to a wider topic um so you have the option to use hashtags that other people have set up and are recommending you can try and find ones that are trending and if you log into twitter you'll often see a couple of them on the left or the right that say trending at the moment um i did have a page open that might have showed me some but i've just closed it um you can also just set up your own so um you can use any combination of words and numbers that's got a hash before it um and that will create a hashtag now it's usually worth checking that no one else is using it first or that if they are you're happy with the way they've been using it um for example i know at an event i was at once uh, they set up a particular hashtag and it turned out that a completely unrelated event had been using a similar one about a month before so it did create some confusion um but yeah it's it's that's basically how they work um you can also get them on facebook but they don't work very well so i think they're of questionable use really on facebook um i can see sean's asked what what is trending which is a good question um trending really is um a a technical word for popular um so it would be a a topic or a hashtag that's particularly popular today um can I, so, can I give a, could i give an example from recently yeah. uh, pick up with ashwin i think one of the interesting things is let's say for instance your interfaith group wanted to look at, around racial justice and you were having a an evening where you were discussing that or you have been discussing it and you wanted to put something out about it over the last year as you will know uh black life matters has been uh, uh a phrase that lots of people have used and it's become a hashtag so you get hashtag blm or hashtag black lives matter and sometimes people put both and that automatically then will point people to your uh to your tweet so if people want to find out what's being going around black lives matters and 
uh, uh, racial justice, if they put a search in for that hashtag, your tweet will come up. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really interesting how you can strategically use tweets in order to focus on the sorts of uh, events that you're doing. And I know this certainly came out in terms of tackling racism in uh, football. There were a number of hashtags uh, around that, around uh, the, uh, the Euros uh, that we've just had. So I think it's interesting that it enables you to, one, highlight what you're contributing to, mm. but also then it drives traffic towards you for people who are interested in that topic. Sorry, Ashley, I, I interrupted. No, I think that's really helpful. And actually one I've just found on Twitter that is trending or popular today is hashtag Tokyo 2020, which you'd expect. Uh, so if you were posting about the Olympics, that would be a good one to include. And it would mean that, you know, somebody who happens to, I don't know, be looking at a tweet by a famous athlete uh, might click on their hashtag and then see a bunch of other related posts including yours so it's a, it's quite a good way to pick up new followers thank you um john um asked a question about how do you close down a facebook page good question uh there are settings on um facebook to do this uh, I will see if I can quickly find them while I ramble. Uh. I think what was there, there has been concern yeah. just to pick up John's uh, interesting question that that very often I think I don't know if this has changed, but certainly when Facebook started, if you put content on the content belonged to Facebook and not to you. Mm -hmm. So effectively, what you could never do was get rid of all that content. You could close the account down, but all of that content remained within the domain of Facebook. And a lot of people felt really uncomfortable about that. I don't know to what extent that's changed or not, but I do know it has made some people reticent to use Facebook because they, they lose the rights to their own material in effect. But whether that's changed or not over the years with legislation, I, I don't know. I think Facebook and most other um, social media networks do have in their privacy policies in terms of conditions, a bunch of buried stuff about how they retain the right to use, you know, data you provide forever, basically. Um, but you do now have options to shut down pages and shut down accounts. Um, and I've just found where that setting lives on, on Facebook at the moment. So can if you screen you, share that? Yeah, I can. Um, let's, let's do that now. So... Um, so this is Facebook. Um, I'm logged in using the admin account for IFN um, and we have our two public pages here on the left and we've also got a couple of unpublic ones which I use for testing. Um, so if I click on the one called test organisation. Are you not going to shut down IFN's Facebook this afternoon are you? I'm not going to do it live, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we can use this dummy account that gets very little use uh, to demonstrate that. Um, so this is the basic outline of a page and you've got the controls down here on the left. Uh, can everyone see these all right? I know I use a very big screen, so it might have shrunk it quite a lot. Yeah, I've got thumbs up, so I'll carry on. Um, so the place to go if you want to shut something down is settings, which is at the bottom of the list on the left. And then right at the bottom of this long list of um, options, I'm gonna make that a bit bigger, um, is remove page. And it says here, delete your page. Um, so if we click that there, it then brings up an option to permanently delete this page. Um, I'm not gonna do that because it's a useful test account for me, but if you click that, it will probably ask you again if you're sure, and then just do it. Um, you also uh, have the ability to, t to make a page invisible to the public, but keep it. Um, so this page is already invisible. It's just a testing page that I use, uh, but the option there is right at the top where it says page visibility. Um, so 
you have the option to flick between page published and page unpublished. Um, so that would be the less kind of nuclear option if you thought you might want to bring it back again at some point in the future. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ashley. Right. Uh, I don't see anything else in the chat, but I'd like to open it up to any thoughts, questions that you might have that either Ashley or others uh, can uh, respond to and uh, perhaps find solutions or have ideas about something that's worked for them. I did think Ashwin's uh, question about, you know, how do you make a page really sexy? How do you drive people to it? That some, somebody here uh, might already have that experience of having a lot of traffic to their site. It might be interesting to reflect on how you've done that, uh, but I, I don't know. So, yes, you'll need to unmute yourself if you're going to uh, ask a question. Um, my question is, um, if you belong to several organizations, that can be a problem because you try to use Twitter and it comes up with the wrong thing. So how do you change that? So that, that's a question about how you manage lots of different accounts, for example. Yeah. Yeah, it's it it's it was in the past a particularly challenging thing on Twitter. Um, it's become easier, I'm pleased to say, um, because you can now remain logged in um, on multiple accounts at the same time, particularly if you're using the phone app. Um, but also actually now on the web. So if I um, do a very quick screen share again. Um, let's just pop that up. So uh, you should now be able to see a Twitter page. Um, this is my personal one, and you can see that down here. It's not usually visible to the public. Um, but if I click there, I can just switch to the interface network one. Um, and I can switch again to the interfaith week one, uh, which I'm signed into. Basically how that works is once you're logged into one account um, and you click on the little three dots down the bottom here, um, you can click the add an existing account button uh, and then add the username and password for another Twitter account. So that then enables you to be logged in in multiples at once and then just switch between them down there it looks a bit different if you're doing it on the phone, but it's basically the same principle. So you can click on where it shows the little profile image and you can add um, different accounts. Facebook works a bit differently. Um, you, you, you have to have a personal account on Facebook from which you manage pages. Um, so for the IFN ones, uh, we actually just set up a dummy personal page, which is called Ashley and its surname is IFN. Um, with hindsight, probably would have been better to call it something that didn't use my name, but uh, we did. Um, and the uh, on there, when you log in to your main page, you can then see the pages you manage down here. Um, but also up the top here, if you click on account, uh, not account, one of these bits. Well, they've moved it again since the last time I did this. Um, it used to be a drop down right at the top, it might be here. Um, no. Pass. I don't know. It used to be there, but it's now moved. So I'll try and find it and show it again in a minute. <laughs> David, you're muted. There we are. That's how most people like me, actually, to be <laughs> muted, to be honest. Uh, Sarah's asked a question Is deleting pages on Facebook the same as deleting groups? Um, not exactly. Um, I think the process is similar, so it will be under the settings section. But with groups, you have the additional option of um, 
kind of archiving it in a way that it, it's still visible to people, but no new activity can be added. Um, so I can't demonstrate that one because we don't have any group set up that I can show you, um, but it, it should be a similar process um, to, to either archive it, which is equivalent of unpublishing it in some ways, or just completely turn it off. Um, but uh, if you want, I can send you a link afterwards, which explains how to do that. I'm, I have to admit, I'm in a bit of a dilemma at the moment because we've got a, a group page um, which was set up about 12 years ago when I was formerly chair of the group and then I moved on to other things. Um, and the page was, the group, everything about it was static. And I had this awful thought that people were looking and saying, this is how I looked when I was young, you know, uh, looking at the images and things like that. So I, at the time the group was in a period of transition and I didn't quite know what to do because it wasn't, didn't feel honest, the whole thing. Uh, so the way I did it was I emailed all the people and said, look, I'm really sorry, we're going to shut this group down. Um, and people say, oh, why are you doing why are you doing it? But actually, from what you've said now, I'm wondering whether it's a good idea to keep that archived, but to actually open up a page which is simpler to maintain um, and, and do that. Can several people edit a page and add things to it, or is it just one person? Um, there are ways to make it so that other people can add to it and edit it. Um, in some ways, the simplest way is to just sh is to create, as we've done, a kind of a personal account, which is the manager account for the page. Mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, as I said, we we ended up using Ashley IFN because we did it years ago, and mm -hmm. if I was doing it today, I might call it IFN admin or something like that. Um, but the uh, that yeah, having one of those accounts then means you can share your username and password with a couple of other people, and they can mm. all use it. Yeah, but yeah. you don't have to give them your username and password for your own personal account, which wouldn't be ideal. So I could do that as a completely separate thing, which have, would have the advantage of continuity. So if I suddenly mm. decided that I'm fed up with old piece and things like that, and decide to skive off it over the horizon, then somebody else could pick it up and keep it going. Then, if they, so long as they had the password and they, oh, that's useful. Okay. Yeah. 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 So your advice, actually, I'm sorry to sort of hog the floor, would be to not to worry about unarchiving, but actually just to start again with a new Facebook page. I think so. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. if, the, if the group hasn't been used in a good few years, then yeah. people are likely not to be finding it anyway. Yeah, that would be good. And if I get into a complete panic, can I email you and say help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate that, because I probably will get into a complete panic. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that we do offer is uh, surgeries. So Ashley, if you want to get in contact with Ashley, he can run a surgery with you which can take you through all the various mm -hmm. things. I see there's a, a question about uh, from Ashwin about Zoom ed re editing Zoom recordings. I think that's probably a surgery type of thing. So if you want to get in touch with Ashley Ashwin, then I think that will be a, a really good thing to do because it's a bit technical, isn't it? It is that one, yeah. Um, video editing is uh, even the, there's some basic stuff you can do that I can show you through a surgery and but you can also turn it into a career and be sort of Steven Spielberg. So there's sort of levels of, of doing it. Um, I can do very basic video editing uh, and I'm happy to share some of the tools for that. That's grand, thank you. Good. Staying with uh, Sarah's point, but moving on to Penny. Penny asked, what's the difference between a group and a page and why would mm. you choose one over another? And if anybody's got any experience about this that they want to chip in, just just raise a hand and uh, uh, you know, feel free to contribute. Actually, what would you say? Yeah, so long before pages existed on Facebook, there were groups. Um, and when Facebook first began, the only type of thing you could have was a personal account, which was, you know, you, it was your, your picture and your bio and the things you're interested in. Um, and then they added groups, um, which were quite similar in some ways to discussion forums and chat rooms that existed sort of in 
the internet long before even Facebook. Um, and they are essentially a space that has a topic or a, a, an organizational focus that people can join and then have free discussions and they can post things and reply to each other and that, that sort of thing. Um, usually if you're the person running it, um, then you'll be an administrator or a moderator, which means that you can delete posts if someone posts something inappropriate or you can um, ban people from the group or temporarily suspend them and those sorts of things. Uh, but a group primarily is about, is about discussion. Uh, pages were added later to Facebook and they were initially designed for businesses um, to be the kind of brand landing page or brand presence on Facebook. And that is more or less how they're used, but there's more versions of it now. So you can be a, a business or brand, but you can also have one if you're a public figure or celebrity, and you can also have one if you're a charity or community group, that sort of thing. Um, and the one of the benefits of pages is that it, it acts almost like a mini website or a mini storefront. You can have the information about your organization, your contact details, um, and then a space where you can post content or updates. Um, but you have a lot more control over how people interact with it than you would for a group. Um, so for example, you can leave it completely open, which means anyone can post on the page. Um, I don't really advise that because I think it, it, it can lead to uh, people sort of hijacking the, the conversation. Um, or you can have it so that nobody can interact at all, uh, which can be tempting, but again, it, it probably limits the usefulness of it. And the middle path is that you enable people to post in reply to your posts, but you don't enable them to post fresh stuff. Um, and that's the approach IFN uses on its uh, pages. So, um, you know, we might post something today saying it's, I don't know, it's Christmas Day or something. It's not, of course, but <laughs> posts of those kinds, and then people might post in response um, or share it or or do other things with it. Um, so, groups often um, can involve more work in the long run through kind of keeping an eye on conversation and policing it if it if it gets um, heated or, or negative um, pages you have a bit more control over the content um, and how people perceive it uh, and again you can still get rid of comments if somebody comes along and posts something wildly inappropriate you can still delete it um, so those are probably the main differences I mean, one of the problems we had with the group over the years um, was you got people who thought, oh, this is a nice bunch of people. I can advertise my yoga class on this. Mm. Um, and also, if a faith group advertises an event, you've got no guarantee it's actually an interfaith event. It could be uh, an evangelizing event. And um, from uh, all faith groups attempted to do that. So it was kind of help would be kind of helpful to have. We've got a policy on how to uh, on what sort of things that we are involved in. Mm. Um, I try to put our, our sort of aims or mission statement fairly prominent in all our correspondence, but I like the idea of the page because it's a little bit easier to control uh, and you can safely go away on holiday and know that everything isn't going to go kibosh while you're away. Mm. Absolutely. And I know, certainly from my experience being in Facebook groups personally that have, you know, a topic of interest. Uh, I'm in a couple of them that have a few thousand members um, and the moderators of those groups, you know, sometimes it becomes almost their entire life's work trying to keep on top of stuff because, um, you know, for weeks and weeks at a time, it may be ticking along perfectly amicably and with not much happening. And then somebody posts one thing and a hundred people find it interesting. And then you've got huge amounts to try and read. Um, so I think, yeah, generally speaking, the pages are a little bit easier to manage um, and, and yeah, keep control of when you go on holiday and it's a very good point. Yeah. Steve, yes, do you want to let yourself in? Uh, yeah, this is, um, I don't know if, if 
other people want to respond to this, uh, or if it's a bit of a red herring, just say so. Um, but in my uh, opinion, I believe that during COVID, um, technology has provided us with a considerable resource that's been able to keep people together. Uh, but I do believe that there's no substitute for bringing people together face to face. As we come out of COVID, um, in order to practice our interfaith, we do need to meet together um, you know, in a room, uh, being actually there. Um, on, the, on the other hand, I, I'm also aware that there are bound to be people who've taken an interest in interfaith because it was something they could take part in um, at home. Um, I think we're in quite a, an important uh, junction here. Um, we, we obviously want to retain those people who've become interested in us. Um, and uh, we do want to meet face to face. We, we want our cake and eat it. Um, I think there's going to be an important um, movement towards a kind of a process by which we're able to engage with those who want to stay at home, but whilst encouraging others to come and meet face to face. And, and that means actually, uh, uh, well, uh, filming or, or um, um, Zooming uh, events into homes. Mm. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Shall I respond to begin with, and then other people might chip in, David? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I have a few thoughts as well. So mm. you go first, because yours will be infinitely more mature than mine. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, I think I think uh, you're absolutely right, Steve. I think there is this tension uh, between the kind of the, the quality of engagement you can have in person that isn't really replicable online, at least not yet. Um, the, the things that we get in person are an ability to, um, you know, pick up on body language, ability to, to make better connections, um, the ability to network in between stuff. Um, so if you're at an event and there's a lunch break, that's a great opportunity to meet people and build relationships. Whereas on Zoom, usually you just see a bunch of little black bits with words in because everyone's gone to the kitchen to make a sandwich. So all of that stuff, I think is still going to be absolutely needed and, and, and people will want um, in-person meetings. Um, but as you say, uh, online meetings, uh, more people can attend who might not have had the time to attend a full meeting because they don't have to travel. So it's, you know, it's a commitment of an hour rather than a commitment of an hour plus half an hour each way to get there, for example. Um, people who have accessibility issues or have caring responsibilities or work responsibilities, uh, it's much easier for, for them to dial in, you know, remotely. Um, for deeply shy people, it's also <laughs> sometimes easier to dial into a meeting online than to turn up to a meeting of people you've never met. Um, so there's lots of benefits to it. And I think you're right that, that hybrid, hybrid approaches are gonna become more common. Um, at the moment, that probably looks like live streaming the event online or, um, you know, recording it so that people can at least see it, even if they can't participate in it. Um, but who knows what the technology will bring? Because I, I think that the the issue you've identified is one that a lot of people have identified. And that probably means that, you know, someone's going to invent a neat solution at some point. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of having a video link, uh, which then streams the event to somewhere like YouTube or Facebook um, could be a really valuable way of getting, you know, having the cake and eating it, as you say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I, I won't add anything to that. I do see that um, David's just asked a question and I did see that David had asked a question about uh, paid boosts on Facebook uh, to which John said, no, in short, waste of money. But uh, it may be, the answer to that may be slightly more complex in uh, or subtle in people's experience. But David, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Still need to unmute yourself. Oh. I, I was going to actually come up with a, 
a, a separate issue. What I, I, I was reflecting the conversation we've just had and, and, and agreeing with it. So yeah, my, my question is precisely that, whether, whether there is any benefit to the boost that, that you have to pay for on Facebook. But I hear what John says. <laughs> um, there are benefits, whether they outweigh the costs is probably um, worth thinking about. But what, what a boost basically lets you do is push your content to people that aren't necessarily going to have seen it otherwise um so usually if you post something from your page only the people that follow your page are going to see it or other people will share it and then see it that way um what the boosting does is it occasionally plonks it on someone's timeline um because it thinks they might be interested in it um now behind that is a whole load of really complicated stuff that where Facebook is tracking everyone's interests and trying to decide what they might be interested in. Um, and you can either let it all work it out for you, um, or you can specify particular things. So you might want to go in and say, um, only show this to people between the ages of 18 and 25 who live in the greater London area and, and express an interest in world religions. That will get you quite a targeted set of people. Um, or yeah, you can leave it as broad as broad as you like. Um, does it work? It certainly shows it to the people and sometimes it will get you more likes and more shares. Um, I think it, 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 it probably lends itself better to when you're selling a product. So it's designed for businesses and the hope is that the people that see it will then click on your website and go and buy the trainers you're selling or whatever. Um, turning seeing stuff into an action when you're a non-profit organization that does interfaith dialogue is a bit different so I, I think john's right in a sense it, it it has some benefits but you've got to weigh up the cost benefit um as to whether it actually brings the benefits you want but if you're simply trying to get a message to a large number of people it has usefulness yeah so the just one one anecdote, and I think the only comment I've seen on the on the Facebook page some months ago was from somebody most irately saying, "I, you know, why did you contact me? I have not the slightest interest in in interfaith." Uh, whether that was from some historic boost that had happened, I don't know, but it it, it underlines the danger. You can actually put people off if it if it goes wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the great thing, though, David, is you can always blame it on Facebook's metrics and say it was nothing to do with us. But somewhere deep in the Californian desert, that was generated just for you, you know. Uh, and perhaps Facebook thinks you should be interested. And if you'd like to make a donation to our group so as not to get this again, please feel free. I, I think that could be. <laughs> can I, uh, I'm just picking things up in the chat. Can I... Uh, go down a couple. One is from uh, Penny, and it's been there a little while. Are there key things needed to make a post impactful? Mm. Well, hopefully others will chip in on this as well. Um, but a couple of things that spring to mind that are true on both Facebook and Twitter um, is usually using a nice image will help um, attract people. Uh, if you imagine you're scrolling through your feed of stuff, um, anything that's going to catch people's eye is going to make them slow down and, and then read the headline at the very least. They might not read further, uh, but it's a good way of catching people. Um, and we, for uh, interesting example from some of the stuff we post as the Interfaith Network, um, we post about lots of religious festivals and they always get a little bit of engagement, um, particularly from people who may follow those, those particular traditions. We found that certain festivals were always doing quite well, including quite a number of the Japanese ones. Uh, and we thought about that for a while. And it turns out it's generally because there are quite good pictures available. So Japanese festivals, you often have quite colourful pictures, maybe cherry blossoms or, you know, traditional Japanese landscapes that are very pretty. Um, 
and inclusion of those pictures makes people stop and read the post. And I think it's sometimes as simple as that, um, having a good attractive thing that will, will a shiny thing almost that, that grabs people's attention. Um, on Facebook, um, as I said, I think earlier, um, interestingly, text pieces seem to get more engagement if they're longer than five paragraphs, which is completely counter to some of the received wisdom on, on brevity being key. Um, so yeah, it, you can post short things with a picture or quite long things without a picture and they seem to do quite well. Um, but impactful is, is a difficult word because it, um, what is impact? And I think defining for yourself what impact would be is also important there. Is it simply the number of people that click it or are you hoping that they'll do something else as well? Could I also say, I think one of the interesting things that is research, uh, and I've not read the very latest on this, but we looked at this a little while ago, but what were the best times to do posts? Mm. But there are different times for Facebook and for Twitter. So people tend to click on Twitter at lunchtime. They're going for lunch and they'll get the phone, they'll have a look at Twitter. So if you're putting things out around about one o'clock, getting a tweet out there, it's more likely to be seen than if you put it out, say, at three or four o'clock. Again, six o'clock in the evening and at 10 o'clock at night, I think were seen as quite key times. Now, it works slightly differently for Facebook because Facebook people go and they tend to mull a little bit. So I think mid-morning, mid-afternoon, mm. mid-evening were times where people were more likely to have a look uh, at Facebook. I'd need to go back and look at the research and we might send something to people to, to, to point them what they, the research says, because I know all social media platforms have been looking at this. When, when are they most effective? Because what I find is I, I, have, I follow so many people on Twitter. Mm. I now only look about the top four to five tweets. Or what I do is I put a search in for one that I might be looking for. Um, because by the time I'd scrolled all the way through, you know, I've sort of lost the will, really. So I think that whole thing about picture is really important, but also I think timing uh, uh, as well. The other thing that you can do, and uh, call me a cynic uh, if, if you want, because they were a fantastic group of uh, ancient philosophers that I managed to study. Uh, so I quite like the cynics. Um, but. Uh, the, one of the things that you, you can do is if you're doing a, um, a tweet or a post, you can also copy people into it by putting their Twitter handle, particularly, I know this mm -hmm. better than Facebook because I use Twitter a lot more. Uh, so actually you copy people in that you want to see it. So automatically it comes up of you've been mentioned in. But also if you want to do something to get something out, across a broader spectrum of people, you might say to people, look, I'm gonna put a tweet out at such and such a time. Would you mind within half an hour of me putting it out just, just to retweet it for me so we can get it to more people. So if you had an event that you wanted to get people to, to let them know about it, you can use your soft networks mm. in order to be able to do that. Because it, what's interesting is the, the amount of saturation that you get within uh, the, uh, within the medium. Mm -hmm. um, okay, can we just go on and the, there was a, another one that Sarah had was, are there any ethical issues with regards to Facebook or Twitter as a business operation that may be a concern? And you've also got a hand up, David, do you want to? Oh, have I? Oh, sorry, Pat, yes. Sorry, unmute Pat, ask that question first and we'll go. Sorry, I, I put my hand up because the question is is about what we're currently discussing, and I know that there's. Oh, that's fine. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Go on, Meg. Um, it was really about content. Um, where do you suggest we look for content? So, for example, I follow other interfaith organisations. If if we don't have anything, you know, that we're particularly posting about, or an event coming up, I follow. Uh, IFN and I, I pinch a lot of theirs, or I should say share a lot of their posts. Um, I understand it's important to try and, you know, keep posts coming. So maybe twice a week if you can. So then I get to a point where I think, well, what on earth can I post about? It's not a religious festival. I haven't come across something I want to share. I haven't got anything to 
say about you know our faiths forum um so i do i do tend to look for interfaith um memes mm -hmm. and with pictures and exactly as you said ashley you know if, if you've got a nice picture with a quote from buddha on it that's that's what i get you know seemingly the most interest or likes on but i just wondered where you would expect people to find content from thank you so i think all the places you're looking already are good um and would have been things i'd suggest so feel free to nick stuff from the interface network um, and you know in general if there are other <coughs> interfaith organizations that you follow um you know people are generally very happy uh, to see their stuff shared so um you know, it would be extremely unlikely, I think, that people would get annoyed by it. They're more likely to be delighted by it because um, it helps them reach a, a wider number of people. Um, religious festivals are one of the ways that we fill gaps. So we have, I think, 150 odd religious festivals um, that we put out tweets and Facebook posts about each uh, across the year. Um, and so that works out at almost one every you know two or three days um and so uh, but we set those up in advance so um, most of them uh, are queued up a couple of months ahead of time um using software that we pay for so you can't do this through facebook and twitter directly um but they sort of go out automatically and then sometimes um the you know and then all the other content is done kind of responsively so uh, it's either something that's definitely coming up soon or it's something that we've just spotted today and it's interesting. Um, so, yeah, I think mainly what you're doing is this the right sort of approach, but I don't know if other people have tips there. I saw that John put short and pithy title helps. Yeah, definitely does. <laughs> um, I mean, another thing you can do is encourage members of your group to provide content which can be through um formally asking for content or it could be through doing something like a photography or poetry competition for example uh, but where you post the entrance via social media um so that that can be quite a nice way of getting other people to contribute without them thinking i'm drafting a facebook post but you know it can still be used as one Thank you. So back to that and ethical issues, Ashley. Are there ethical issues with using Facebook or Twitter? Uh, undoubtedly, yeah. Um, I think I won't dwell on the specifics of either of them, uh, but I think as with any large company, um, you know, people have different ethical views on their conduct, the way that they do business. Um, with social media as well, there are additional things around privacy and use of data that some people have concerns about. Um, I can't answer the question for you what the balance is between, you know, should I do it or is it too ethically dodgy? Um, that's obviously something people have to work out for themselves. Um, but there are lots of writings on it so if it's something you you're interested in um i would have a google and see what other people are writing because there's an awful lot out there and you, it will help you come to those decisions i think i think john brings up an interesting point in the chat in terms of uh copyright hmm. and sometimes that you know you can't use music because it's copyrighted and youtube will block it up you know, bit. but there are also other sorts of things like uh, somebody may have copyrighted something that you use. And if you haven't asked their permission, there can be an issue there. I think most people are kind, but there are things like that. The other thing is, of course, using images without permissions. And I think that is something that we're really aware of, particularly if that involves children or vulnerable people. Um, and certainly when I, uh, in, in my previous life to work in at IFN, one of the things that we had become critically aware of in terms of safeguarding children, also vulnerability 
of uh, women in terms of domestic abuse and violence, because we saw this uh, in the local authority I was where, uh, on, where a school had put a picture on Facebook with children. One of those children shouldn't have been in the picture. Uh, it was seen by a grandparent who then told the, um, uh, the husband and there was a restraining order on the husband. He wasn't allowed within 20 miles of the, you know, he'd been so violent toward her, but they were able because of the school uniform to track down the school. Mm. Um, there was a, a mistake at the school that was recognized, but he found the family and tragically he did kill the mother. I mean, that's extreme. Mm. But it did open up all sorts of issues. And that's because it was at a time when that technology was emerging. So people were much less aware of, of the dangers. Mm. Uh, so I do think it's really important that if you're going to take images, use images of your group, so that you, you do have permissions to be able to use people's images. Um, and also, if you're quoting people, uh, always check that you've, they're happy with the quote. Because mm. uh, some people may so, say something in confidence, which might be offensive to members of their own faith community body. And then that can cause problem for those people in that faith community body, particularly if they're not prepared for somebody to have a go at them. We did have an issue once where we had a photograph of a Muslim woman sitting quite close to a, a man who was not her husband. And certainly we had that picture on Facebook and we, we had not a barrage, but we had a number of people who started picking this up as an issue from a very particular Islamic point of view, and it became quite unpleasant. So mm -hmm. I think it, there are those sorts of ethical issues about how that has an impact upon the people that you're highlighting or, uh, you know, whose coach you're using. Just on that, David, I think one thing to add is um, also be willing to be responsive. So if someone's given you permission but they subsequently decide they want to withdraw it um let them and, and you know take the thing down um i can think of an example from ifn where we did a video interview with loads of young people uh, we did about 30 of them put them all up as clips on youtube and then maybe three four years later one of the young people said you know, I'm, I'm now trying to look for jobs and every time people search for my name, this is the first thing that comes up on Google. Could you please take it down because it's not helping? And yeah, we did, even though we had the signed consent forms and the releases and everything in place. Um, you know, just being kind of willing to um, respond to how things change, I think can be very helpful. Um, and David, I've had a message that's come through to just me, which is um, asking for tips on how to not allow social media to take over your life. Thank you, Sean. Um, <laughs> so a couple of thoughts on that. Um, it, it certainly has the potential to, uh, and for one week a year, it definitely takes over mine, and that's into faith week. Um, because we see, well, I think last time we saw seven odd thousand tweets uh, during the week and that's just Twitter so other platforms as well and we try to see all of them and and like most of them and share some of them um, but generally speaking um, and of course that the level of engagement there wouldn't be sustainable if I tried to do it even for a month let alone all year um, uh, and but generally the level of activity is going to be lower than that um, so I would say start small um you know for example only take on one thing don't take on everything um all at once and build up as you feel more confident and as, as capacity allows and that may mean that you have a member of your group who does the facebook stuff and a different person that does instagram or twitter uh it may mean that you just have facebook and not the others um you know th there's different ways of doing it but i think and the other thing to remember actually is the more you post the more you're likely to see engagement so if you slow down a bit in terms of you know you go from posting three things a day to three things a week you're probably going to see a bit less coming in as well so there's ways to manage it um but if things you know become unmanageable then you do have the option to just turn it all off for a bit and go on holiday 
Um, and sometimes that's necessary. I don't think there's, I think there's anything wrong with doing that. Thank you. I do, I do think it, it is important, you know, look, looking at social media to say, you know, what are you trying to achieve? How would you know that you'd achieved it? You know, what would success look like in terms of what you're doing? And how do you, how can you manage that best? Uh, because, you know, other than Ashley and myself who are paid to do interfaith things in a sense, you know, I don't think anybody else here is, you know, it, it, it's not what you're doing all of the time. So I think mm -hmm. managing your own expectations of yourself is also quite important. I think as well that our little tricks and something I think that it was Steve uh, mentioned earlier, which I think uh, is quite interesting when he was talking about running the website. So he does the website and Ashwin does the social media. It is possible to integrate those together and lots of website designs actually have the social media feed there running in them. So ours does, so you can see what we've tweeted today. Mm -hmm. I think. Can you? Yeah. yeah. I can even show you that if you like. Yeah. Um, so I'll do a very quick screen share again. This is, um, oh, it's got your pictures over the top, there we are. Uh, this is the Interfaith Networks um, homepage. Um, and two things you'll see is right at the top here, you've got links to our Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then right at the bottom, our Twitter feed is there. So all of our, our latest four tweets are visible at the bottom of the screen. We also got a page under news where we've embedded the tweets from Facebook and, uh, sorry, embedded the feeds from Facebook and Twitter. So you can see our most recent Facebook posts and our most recent tweets are there. The benefit of us doing that um, is that uh, particularly for us was that we know a number of people don't have a Facebook account or a Twitter account and therefore we wanted them to be able to see the content without having to log in. Um, Twitter you don't normally have to log in but Facebook you often do so this sort of enabled people to see what we were doing without having to log in. Um, and it's not particularly difficult to do this. Um, Facebook and Twitter will both provide you with a set piece of code that you just copy and then dump into your website on in the relevant place. Um, so it, it, it can be done by the kind of competent amateur, not just by developers and programmers. Mm. I think that's quite useful, thank you. I'll just go back to the chat. Uh, I saw that uh, John's put some really use, useful things in the chat. Um, but one of the things he does ask about is Eventbrite. And do many people here use Eventbrite? Yes, no? <laughs> no, no. John, do you want to say something about Eventbrite and how you found it? Yeah, I found Eventbrite really good because um, I think one of the problems with our groups is we really don't know who's going to turn up. Um, and so we would advertise an event and it can be really embarrassing. We've got a really good speaker and five people turn up. So if you've got Eventbrite, you do know who's actually booked. You can contact them. They will do all the work for you. They'll send out emails for you. If you set it up, so you can send them reminders, which people need nowadays. Um, we just had an event. We went to Woking Mosque on Sunday, and I had 22 booked, and I think actually about 18 turned up. So it gave me a lot of confidence that we were going to have a really, and it was a great day. Actually, it was fantastic. Although it rained all the time. <laughs> and, and I do recommend event right for, for some things, not for everything. Um, but I think it, it definitely does help you to know who's going to turn up. I think that, that could be really important. Um, I think, David, you came to something last year that we did, which was for Remembrance uh, Sunday. Uh, but we also did a, a really fantastic event at the mosque where we had um, um, Cardinal Michael Fitzgerald. And having got him, you know, and having got... Um, some really good speakers. I really, I really wanted a good audience, and we got it. Excellent. 
specific to that. So that's worth considering. It doesn't cost anything. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> yes. We've, we've certainly noticed a lot more people using Eventbrite for their Interfaith Week events over the last two years. Um, it's gone from a place where we'd find details of a handful of events each year to being kind of the primary source now for us when we're looking for stuff. I think it was yeah, probably at least 50% of the activities were also listed on Eventbrite last year. So it has usefulness. And particularly, as John said, for knowing how many people might be coming. Can I just ask something about Instagram? I've just looked at it again. I've actually got two accounts on Instagram um, for other organisations. Can I add a third one for the interfaith group? Um, yes. So you should be able to set up as many accounts as you like, as long as you've got an email address that's different for each one that you can okay. use. Okay, right. Um, okay. I think that's the main thing that you need. But um, And if you're running them off a phone, you can also do the thing where you flick between multiple accounts, like on Twitter and Facebook. I haven't yet seen that that's possible on the, the, the computer version, but Instagram on a computer doesn't work especially well anyway. It's, it's, right. one, of, it's one of those that's designed for kind of phones first. Thank you, John. Uh, I mean, and the other thing as well that you can have on um, Instagram uh, is Reels, um, mm -hmm. which is a sort of version of TikTok. Uh, TikTok isn't an Octoc tick, it's TikTok. You know these things, I, d I don't. Yeah. I, I can't do all that dancing, it's too much for me. Um, but uh, which enables you to put in videos, uh, short videos. Mm -hmm. uh, and very often they're humorous, but not always, uh, which is quite interesting. And the other thing as well that you have is a function where you can put something that just goes up on the top. And it's a short thing and it only lasts for about 24 hours. So you can put something up and, uh, and then it will disappear. So it might be something that you've done at an event that you, you videoed and you might have a comment, you can put it up, lasts about 15 seconds and yeah. then, then it goes and disappears. And that is quite interesting as well. If you, if you want to play with uh, Instagram, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting medium. We, we're coming to, to the end. Um, we've got a few, a few more minutes. Uh, I was thinking about, I've been reflecting on Steve's question about the hybrid nature of possible future interfaith. Uh, and uh, my wife is a great lover of James Bond films. And I remember the one where they had all the big screens up uh, and uh, everybody was able to talk to each other from all over the world and, and, and plot the, the destruction of the world in that process. I, I'm not suggesting you do that, but I do think it's interesting that we had a hybrid AGM this year where mm -hmm. we had people in person and we had people there on Zoom. And I do think that Perhaps in the future, it may be interesting to work out how you would do that, but particularly the sort of technology. What you don't want is a meeting that I was at where we had eight people in the room and a laptop at a distance and the person on the laptop was talking out and you couldn't all see who they were. Uh, and sometimes the internet connection went down and they had to come back in again, you know. So I do think it's interesting, but I think those solutions to that are actually probably going to grow over time because I do think this sort of medium has allowed things which would just would not have been possible even two years mm. ago, you know. So uh, I think that's really good. Has anybody got any burning questions they'd like to ask Ashley or anyone else before we say au revoir and bon, bonsoir, just to show we can be a little bit international as well. Mm. I was just thinking, I mean, Ashley kindly said um, that you would offer help with things like that. Would that be just a case of emailing you and saying, is there a convenient time perhaps for a Zoom meeting or something like that to work through something like that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so we, we or I really, uh, are doing surgeries for um, local groups in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so if you email me, um, I'll reply to try and set up a time and then we can have a Zoom meeting one-on-one -on -one or with you and a couple of your colleagues if you prefer 
um, and I will try and show you stuff kind of one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom. So we'll do screen share and talk through mm -hmm. things that way. I'm not an expert in everything. Um, in fact, I'm not really an expert in social media at all, but I have quite good knowledge of lots of it and some knowledge of other bits and no knowledge of some things. So um, I, I would be very bad at helping if you needed help with Microsoft Teams, but quite good helping if you needed Zoom. Um, I, I think it would be brilliant. I live in the dark ages and it's lovely to get someone who'd be prepared to help us. I mean, in connection with you were saying about ways of meeting and how the challenge of meeting in person. Um, on Sunday, we had an interfaith community picnic and it was really easy to arrange. And I think it did show how incredibly lonely some people are because basically all it involved was putting a gazebo up and sitting in the middle of a field. Uh, and letting people you were there, there and they came and it was a wonderful event. Um, I think sometimes you can be really ambitious and try complicated things when actually it's the human contact that people seem to need the most. It doesn't have to be rocket science. And it was nice. It was very nice. That's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, could I say thank you so much thank you for all those people who put questions into the uh, uh chat and uh, you know um and all those who responded uh as ashley said he's there if anybody wants to talk about some of the more technical stuff uh he's the man to go to and if he if he doesn't know he'd know somebody who does know uh which i think is important so you know we can build up those links i really hope this afternoon has been useful uh, it's so good to see so many people I haven't seen for quite a while, uh, which is great. I haven't seen David for uh, for ages, I don't think. Uh, and I'm just, if I just stand, you look out your window, uh, I'm waving to you from uh, West Coker at the moment, uh, uh, over towards Bath. So oh, yeah. If, if you can see me, I'm, I'm just in South Somerset. I, I know you're, uh, you're... Your vicar down there is, is an old mate of mine. Oh, really? Colin. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's a oh, small hey. world. <laughs> it is a very small world indeed. So thank you. So, uh, <laughs> so that's a great pleasure, uh, Sean Garmahagat, uh, which is thank you very much, my friend. So that's uh, uh, brilliant. And just because we try to meet the ethnic needs of every, everybody, Shlon uh, Adasbanak Jia. But that's absolutely fantastic. We're going to stop now. If you want to get in touch, please do. And I hope you have a really lovely and safe rest of the day. And hopefully thank, we can meet again soon. Th thank you very much, David. And thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, to oh, thank, very, you. Very thank you very much. Thank All you. the best to everybody. Bye now.